Okay, so it has been our practice to share the introduction of each talk among Aurora board members, so you will have a chance to meet us all over the course of the series. And today, that responsibility has fallen upon me. So I will briefly introduce myself, Aurora, and our speaker. So my name is Peter Anik. I'm a researcher in computational linguistics at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. And as such, I have the distinction of being the easternmost member of the Aurora board. We don't have a whole lot of rock art in Massachusetts, but we likely have the earliest documented petroglyph boulder in North America, first described in 1680. And called Dighton Rock, it has enjoyed a long history of speculation about its origin, ascribed at times to not only Native Americans, but also Portuguese, Viking, and even Phoenician explorers. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Arara, the American Rock Art Research Association is a diverse community with wide ranging interests dedicated to rock art preservation, research, and education. We view rock art as an important expression of a shared cultural heritage, a heritage which in some cases continues today. Arara hosts talks on a monthly basis, so please stop in on our website to stay up to date with our online presentations as well as the many other things the organization is involved with. We publish a newsletter called La Pintora and an annual full color volume of papers called American Indian Rock Art. We encourage all our past members to keep their membership current by renewing. And if you aren't a member, check us out and consider joining us. We have an active Facebook page with posts about rock art from all over the world. Please give us a like if you like what's there. We have also created an Aurora YouTube channel where we post our talks so you can catch up on missed presentations or get a recap. Now, I discovered the work of today's speaker while I was researching the petroglyphs and pictographs of northern New England. Dagmara Zavatska is one of a small group of scholars who are exploring the rock art of the Canadian Shield, not only documenting sites, but also attempting to use the landscape and cultural context to shed light on their meaning and function. Dagmara received her bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Toronto, her master's in anthropology from Trent University, and her PhD in art history from the University of Quebec in Montreal. She has taught courses on indigenous arts at Université de Québec and Montréal and University of Ottawa. She has published in the Canadian Journal of Archaeology, Time and Mind, the Journal of Archaeology, Consciousness and Culture, and Ontario archaeology. She has also collaborated on the first ever virtual exhibit of rock art in Canada called Images, and St Images on Stone. It was launched in 2019 by the Musée de la Civilisation in Quebec City in Université du Québec and Montréal. It's a very informative look at five sites from Nova Scotia to British Columbia, and I have put the URL in the chat so you can um, check that out um, later. And now I am happy to turn the program over to Dagmara Zavatska. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming um, to my talk. Um, I wanna begin with a uh, land acknowledgement. I'm actually in Montreal um, in case you uh, didn't know. Um, so I wanna acknowledge that Georgiage, Montreal is, unseated, is on unceded indigenous lands and the island is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. The Ganyangahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which I meet with you virtually today. I also want to acknowledge the unceded lands of the Temeogoma Anishinaabe Nation uh, about whose rock art I'm gonna be um, talking to you about today. Um, so today I want to talk about the rock art of the Temagami area in northeastern Ontario and its public rock art sites. That is sites that had many functions. Um, they were places where other than human person can, persons can be contacted. There were places that helped to navigate water routes and they were places that were possibly implicated in the negotiation of social boundaries. So um, the Canadian Shield, what you see here uh, in red on the screen, is a physiographic region that stretches from Quebec to um, Saskatchewan. And this region is characterized by immense boreal forests and, and plenty of lakes and rivers that form a dense and complex labyrinth that has been used as travel routes by Algonquin-speaking peoples. 
Um, this region is home to a rock art tradition known as Canadian Shield rock art. Um, this tradition is known for its red ochre pictographs painted on vertical waterside cliffs and petroglyphs abraded or incised into rocky outcrops, uh, which, are, which also are uh, located near water bodies as well as in the bush. And right now we know um, there's around 800 pictograph sites we know about and only 30 petroglyph sites. And the creation of rock art, it, it extends at least over two millennia into the past However, the sites were created well into the post-contact period into the 19th century. And the pictorial content consists of uh, images, uh, representational images of zoomorphs, anthropomorphs, items of material culture, as well as depiction of, uh, depictions of other than human persons. And many of the marks left on the rocks have been called abstractions. So the so-called abstractions, they consist of geometric motifs, such as circles, crosses, parallel lines, and indeterminate figures. But they are very, very numer numerous. And what you see on this, um, on this slide here is actually um, rock art is not uh, all across the Canadian Shield. It's not all over the Canadian Shield. Um, Actually, a lot of it is located here in Northwestern Ontario. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about Northeastern Ontario. There's some in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. In Quebec, where I am, um, there's roughly 20 sites only that are known of at this moment, but research has started later as well. So that kind of explains why um, we don't know that much about uh, rock art in Quebec. Um, so landscapes. Uh, landscapes are homes to people's experiences, activities, stories, and memories, which are intimately connected with places, paths, animals, plants, and other components of the human lived-in world. And the Algonquin-speaking peoples of the Canadian Shield experience their landscape through relational ontology, where people are holistically immersed within the land and they cultivate social relations with its non-human components. So animals, plants, even weather phenomena, think about um, thunderstorms. Um, so within this relational ontology, land is animate and implicated in the flow of the vital forces that sustain all life. Land and people are interrelated prompting the blurring of distinctions among the two, as is evinced by uh, the statement that you see here on the screen. Our people talk about me and the land being the same. I am the environment and the land is one of our very close relatives. And this is from uh, Leroy Little Bear and he's a Blackfoot um, elder. Certain places, natural phenomena and material culture are alive and they are endowed with agency. Places such as mountains, lakes, rock effigy formations are inhabited with spirit spiritual powers. This animacy and agency stem, stem from spiritual ideas associated with the physical world and they emerge in the process of relational engagement between humans and objects or places and questions. So experience is crucial. Material culture and certain locations in the landscape can help build and sustain relationships essential for the well being of living entities. Rock art sites, which served various functions, are among such places. So, rock art is sacred to indigenous peoples. Um, these places are linked with other than human persons. Um, rock art was made by medicine men and vision questing youth. It is also associated with the Meme Gueshivuk that I'm pointing to on the screen right now, um, other than human beings who live within cliffs on water. And with some rock art sites, uh, we know, uh, we've been told that they were made by the Meme Gueshivuk. So the images are depictions of dream visions, future events and sympathetic magic. And they convey various teachings within the landscape that affirm the cultural, political, and historical ties of peoples to their territories. Um, rock art was also implicated in the navigation of the extensive water network, and it helped to exchange information in the landscape. 
And what you see here on the screen is a typical Canadian Shield rock art site. It's on the water, on a nice cliff, and the images are uh, painted with red ochre. And just as an aside, um, I am in the Eastern Canadian Shield and images in the East, they tend to be uh, much more abstract than um, representational. So the Temagami area um, is located in Northeastern Ontario um, and the region encompasses Lake Temagami and the surrounding lands. And the area corresponds roughly to uh, Ndakimenan, which is the ancestral territory of the local Teme Agoma Anishinaabe. And in the north, its boundary reaches the height of the land by the bend in the West Montreal River. In the south, the boundary is drawn at the confluence of um, Sturgeon and Temagami rivers. In the west, the boundary is made by the Sturgeon River. And in the east, it reaches um, the coastline of Lake Temiskaming between uh, the mouths of Matabichuan and um, Montreal rivers. And um, I just want to point out Montreal River. I'm going to go back to this uh, river a few times. So this river right here. Um, so Ndaki Menan, it means in Anishinaabemowin, our, our land, and the name Temagami means deep water or the place of deep water. And it is after this like that the local um, indigenous community um, call themselves um, the people of the deep water. So um, there are at least 54 uh, pictograph sites located on vertical waterside cliffs in this area. And 49 are actually within Ndaki Menan. Um, other ones are on the periphery, just outside. And major concentrations of sites, they occur on Lake Temagami, Anemani Pissing Lake, and Ababika Lake. And um, the images present uh, that are there, they include canoes um, with occupants, which are usually just um, basically um, brush strokes made with fingers. So, you know, vertical lines. You have zoomorphs, so you have uh, cervids, so you have all sorts of moose and, and uh, probably deer. You have canids, so possibly a dog or a wolf. Um, you also have powerful, powerful beings, so you have thunderbirds. And this is actually a possible representation of a thunderbird right here that you see. You even have a representation of a horned snake, so a snake with horns. And then you have um, a lot of anthropomorphic figures, you know, it's mostly um, stick figures. And, um, but what you really get, <laughs> what you really, really get in the Tamagami area, it's abstractions, the so-called abstractions. So you get circles, you get crosses, you get lines, and you get a lot of indeterminate figures. So um, it's very hard to say what you're actually looking at, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to even identify what you're actually looking at. Um, so rock art in the Canadian Shield, uh, it served many functions simultaneously. Um, and the research uh, carried out since the 1960s um, has demonstrated that rock art sites are sacred. Connections between travel routes and rock art have been explored since the 1980s. However, it is the work of John Norder in Northwestern Ontario and mine in Northeastern that clearly demonstrated this connection. And John Norder has also looked at the types of social interactions that rock art could facilitate and the type of information, uh, general information or specialized information that rock art could convey in the landscape. So um, building on previous work, especially of John Oshia and Claire McHale Milner, and armed with a more robust ethnographic record, I also explored uh, rock art sites as places where interaction between various nations took place. So we're kind of moving beyond the standard sacred interpretations. So what you have here is a list of possible um, rock art functions. Um, so you have sacred places, um, that is places where communication with other than human persons was undertaken, where medicine practiced their rights, and where individual rituals such as fasting uh, or communal rituals could be held. And then you have travel aids, uh, rock art as travel aids um, that helped in the navigation of the waterways and where other than human persons could be placated for safe passage 
uh, for example, with offerings of tobacco. Um, so obviously those sites will be located on travel routes. And um, I just want to point out as well that we're never away from um, this connection with the spiritual and the sacred, even in something that could be perceived as functional, you know, practical. We have to navigate this, um, this, this water route. Well, this um, component, this spiritual component is always going to be present. So making those distinctions uh, between sacred and secular, it, it really doesn't work. And finally, the third um, uh, function that um, I'm going to be discussing, because, uh, you know, there can be other ones as well, probably ones that we don't even think about. Well, uh, it could be mechanisms that structured intergroup interactions by helping to negotiate social boundaries. Um, so uh, rituals undertaken at rock art sites could have facilitated interactions with and, and, and with an integration of outsiders. So people basically who came from um, outside of your of your nation, of your band, this could be the place where you would meet and you, where you would interact. Um, so I'm mentioning here um, social boundaries. Uh, social boundaries are about access to social groups and their knowledge of the environment. So this is what you wanna get access to when you're going into this vast territory to know where the passages are, where the resources are. So access to knowledge about the territory and recreation and creation of alliances between nations would be carried out during ceremonies uh, which would take place in strategic locations on major water routes in, in well-known conspicuous places, which would be located at the entry or exit points of the territory. That would be the ideal places to have this type of interaction. Um, so these functions, they allowed for various relationships to be fostered within the relational ontology landscape. Um, so rock, rock art places, they are nodes where, where relationships were cultivated between places, peoples and other than human persons. So it's, it's kind of this big flux where everybody's interacting and those divisions between sacred and secular, they really, um, they really don't function in, in the context of, of rock art. So um, these functions, um, they emerge from the landscape context of rock art sites. Um, so the characteristics of the rock outcrop and the place itself. So um, the placement of rock art in relation to other culturally significant sites, such as sacred sites, effigy rock formations, paths, and territorial boundaries, all of this um, had a bearing on where rock art is going to be placed. And the functions that the sites fulfilled can also be deduced from the image content, the number and the diversity of the images at the site. The properties of the cliff, um, they include presence of crack and fissure, cracks and fissures. So what you have here, for example, this beautiful crack at a rock art site. Um, the presence of calcite and silica deposits and those white drips that you see covering rocks. As well as the height of the cliff, um, the color and the shape of the cliff. So for example, this amazing place, which is diamond shaped. And since the 1970s, um, it has been recognized that these properties um, are imbued with spiritual significance. Um, so for example, high cliffs, um, they are linked with thunderbirds. So these properties can also render a place salient in the landscape and salient cliffs, they attract greater attention. They become landmarks that can act in various contexts of engagement as places of spiritual power, beacons in navigation, or anchors for group meetings. So conspicuous places are, are very important in the landscape. As for the images, um, their meaning is extremely elusive and it changes over time. This has to be recognized and I guess it's well known at this point. Uh, what I find more interesting um, to examine is the content of the images and which sites had the most images and the greatest variety of images. So um, around 75% of um, the rock art motifs in the Temagami area, they are the so-called abstractions, 
especially lines. You have lines galore, lines everywhere. <laughs> so um, among the abstractions, uh, some of them are simple, like the ones you see here on the screen that I'm pointing to. So those rows of parallel lines, um, which we call tally marks. And some of them are uh, more convoluted and more complex, like this one in the middle. And these simple abstractions, uh, whether they be, um, you know, parallel lines, um, single lines, um, check marks, um, crosses, um, they are the most numerous, really. Um, they are like all over the place. Um, and those um, more complex abstractions, they tend to be uh, much more rare. They're not that uh, common in the area. Um, <clears throat> So um, what I wanted to see is um, where those um, abstractions were, as well as where figure, uh, representational, those figurative images were. And those images, like what you see here, for example, um, this is from Diamond Lake, and um, this is supposed to be a bear. But thanks to this stretch, <laughs> uh, we know that um, there was actually at some point something else over there, because there's like this tail coming out of it, of this, of this creature. So you have like um, anthrop uh, zoomorphs like that. You have canoes. So this is like the standard beautiful canoe with um, uh, occupants. And then you have those anthropomorphs. And this one I, in particular, it's a, it's a very special anthropomorph because it's, it's, it's one of a kind. Usually uh, they're stick figures. But point is that those images are much more rare than those um, simple abstractions. So uh, what I wanted to see is uh, where those uh, representational images were, um, where they were located versus you know, all the rest, um, the, those abstractions, whether they be um, rare abstractions or um, the very uh, common ones. So um, following the work of Richard Bradley, um, the messages that rock art images convey can be more or less accessible. So access to these messages can be restricted through the image content as not all of the segments of the population were able to interpret the images, especially if, this, if they had various meanings. So Bradley argued that the audience of a rock art site can be restricted in two ways, through physical access or through the accessibility of the information contained in the images. So easily interpreted figurative images would be more likely uh, to fall under this general, generalized knowledge. Um, so something uh, like, you know, those parallel tally marks. Uh, <clears throat> but complex abstract figures, uh, they would be more likely associated with this specialized knowledge that would be restricted um, to few individuals. So um, the so-called so abstractions can lead to a proliferations of meanings, um, especially in the case of simple abstractions. You can have a lot of meanings. You can ascribe a lot of meanings to those um, abstractions. So um, they're not linked with the specialized knowledge, um, which this restricted meanings would be linked more with those um, complex abstractions or unique images. That's at least how I see it. That's how, how, I, um, how I see rock art for the moment. I mean, it might change one day, but <laughs> that's for the moment. <laughs> um, so uh, what do I mean by uh, public sites? So public sites, they were salient. Um, such sites were on conspicuous cliffs uh, whose characteristics attested to the spiritual forces inherent within, while, while also render, rendering the cliff uh, noticeable in the landscape. So uh, more easily uh, identifiable uh, as, as a gathering spot. It would be just easier to go to a place like that that can be easily identified in the landscape. And for those of you who have never been in the Canadian Shield, <laughs> let me tell you, it gets kind of monotonous at some point where you keep on seeing, you know, the smaller cliffs and the overgrown coastline, you know. So when there's something that strikes you that comes out, you see it. Trust me, you see it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So um, the sites um, would be located in easily accessible uh, places along important routes and near large aggregations of people. So near or on large lakes, because that's usually the lakes that tend to be uh, places where you, where you find um, traces of human habitation that can 
you know, go back um, centuries or even millennia into the past, those big lakes were always preferred. Um, such places, um, they would be interacted with more because of increased human circulation and proximity. Um, such places also provided the necessary space for meetings. So public sites, they would need this necessary space for meetings. So for example, there would be a nearby large ledge. Don't forget, we're on water. So if there's a large ledge, that's great because then you can meet, you can get out of your canoe and meet together for a ceremony. Or um, there would be um, campsites nearby, open spaces nearby. Though I admit um, that people could have also gathered in watercrafts and just stayed in their canoes. And these places, they were better suited for communal rituals. Um, so I want to underline that public sites were located on major travel routes. Um, for example, those um, that lead in and out of the territory of Ndakimenan or those that are on the important interior routes. So in terms of images, uh, public sites uh, that were visited more often would have had many varied images, both abstract and representational, that would convey information to the Temagama Anishinaabe and non-band members, so outsiders coming in. Uh, so, so at least some of the images were easily interpreted and incorporated into uh, various contexts of engagement. So our uh, representational images might be more likely located at such sites. And don't forget, they're rare. As I just said, representational figurative imagery is rare. However, the content, the number, and the variability of the pictorial content are not the definitive criteria for identifying places where individual and communal rituals took place. Because a site with many and varied um, images can be the result of communal rituals undertaken for various purposes. But it is also possible that such an image inventory um, is the culmination of separate episodes of individual rituals. Um, I'm sorry, um, I just had a chat thing pop up. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a site with many and varied, varied images can be the result of communal rituals undertaken for various purposes, uh, or it can be just episodes of individual um, uh, rituals that were basically culminating over time. Because that's the other problem. We don't know the dates of this rock art. We don't know when it was made. We don't know if all of the images were created at the same time or if they were created over a certain uh, span of time. We don't know that at this point. So it's it's kind of like this view that I can only adopt this um, synchronic view of, of, of the place. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so it seems that the landscape context um, is, is more important uh, than the pictorial content, finally, uh, especially since places endowed with agency would beckon people to visit them and create rock art. Um, so the water route and the salience of the place would play a great role in determining if a site was going to be visited by many people and be public. So it's really the landscape context that, that is super important. So it was the site's location on a travel route and this route's importance within the hydrographic network that mattered. Was it a major route? Was it a secondary route? This is what was, uh, I think, more important than, than the images that ended up on the rock. And I just wanna contrast this with private sites, uh, which I'm not discussing, but uh, at private sites, the images, um, from what I saw, they were less visible um, there would be um, the elusive rare complex abstractions um, had a higher chance to be actually found at these sites. So they would be associated with particular specific knowledge that was being conveyed. Um, those private sites uh, were found on lesser, lesser traveled routes. And if they were located on major routes, they were not in salient places. So they were not necessarily jumping out at you in the landscape. Uh, and such sites were probably the results of fewer episodes of individual rituals, though communal rituals could also take place in those locations. I mean, I'm not excluding uh, that possibility as well. Um, and 
private sites, they would be uh, of greater importance um, to a more restricted audience, um, especially to those who dwelled in the vicinity. Those distinctions between private and public that I'm just, I, I just told you, um, they are in no way meant um, to be sharp and permanent. Um, the sites might have switched between the two categories over time and depending on the needs of the community. In the context of the Temagami area, um, it is better to talk about a gamut of sites that ranged from public to private, so kind of on a spectrum, uh, more likely than just, you know, those rigid um, divisions. So um, I kept talking about communal rituals. So what are examples of communal rituals? Because um, we all know that, you know, individual rituals, that would be, for example, fasting, which is most often associated with rock art. Um, so examples of communal rituals uh, are rare, um, and those that we have often include medicine men. Um, so for example, there is an account um, of a site from Manitoba in Canada called the Oxford House, and uh, this account basically says there was a medicine man who painted a figure of a Meimei Guishi on a cliff that was inhabited by these beings, and he did it in front of the community in order to commemorate the gift of medicines that saved a woman's life. And there is another story uh, related by uh, the indigenous anthropologist, William Jones, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, he described how people watched a duel between two medicine men at a steep cliff at what is called the place of the pipestone or red rock. And this is on Nipigon, Nipigon Bay on Lake Superior. And um, the first man, the first medicine man, he angered the Meimei Guishivuk and was subsequently killed by them. Um, rock art is not mentioned in this account, uh, but there is a large pictograph site in this area. And um, <clears throat> some sites are mentioned in missionaries and explorers accounts because they were places where uh, rituals and interactions between different nations to, took place. However, uh, what is interesting is that um, those missionary accounts, they uh, will mention the place, but they will very, very rarely um, discuss the rock art, but we know it's there. So at least we have that going for us. <laughs> um, so uh, for example, picture rock, which you see here on the screen, this painting from 1947. Um, so picture rock uh, has been described by a bunch of um, explorers. Um, and it was described by the explorer and the fur trader, Sir Alexander Mackenzie, at the end of the 18th century. And, and he said, and I quote, um, he described it as a remarkable rock with a smooth face, but split and cracked in different parts, which hang over the water into one of its horizontal chasms, a great number of arrows have been shot which is said to have been done by a war party of the Nadoasis or Sioux, who had done much mischief in this country and left these weapons as a warning to the Shebwa or Ojibwe or natives that notwithstanding its lakes, rivers and rocks, it was not inaccessible to their enemies." End of quote. Um, so the images at this site, um, I haven't seen the site in person, but um, I know what the images are thanks to um, Selwyn Dudney's uh, tracings. And Selwyn Dudney, for, um, for all of you, he was the father of uh, Canadian rock art research. So he um, did the tracings of this site and uh, what they include the images. Well, there's a lot of animals, including a moose smoking a pipe. Um, there's uh, figures with horns, and horns in Algonquian beliefs, um, they denote, denote power. Um, there's um, canoes, and there is, of course, abstractions. So this is one site where different uh, groups uh, would be interacting, whether it was for positive or uh, in a positive or negative way. Um, there is another important site um, called Rocher Loiseau. Um, this is a site on the Ottawa River, so this important Ottawa River that goes into the St. Lawrence River, and it's on the Quebec side of the river. And uh, this site has been um, described in 17th century uh, French uh, recollect and Jesuit uh, missionary accounts. And um, they, they basically, they, they also, did, they, they didn't say anything about the rock art, but they are describing this place. 
And they said that this um, important place, um, basically on this very, very important travel route, uh, was a place uh, where um, travel-related rituals that consisted of tobacco offerings were made. So another place where uh, different people uh, will be stopping by, making an offering of tobacco so they can keep uh, going up the river, um, going up north and um, you know, having a safe travel. Because it's uh, it can be kind of tricky um, canoeing. I mean, uh, uh, those rivers and those lakes. Um, <clears throat> it is also worth mentioning um, as well that uh, rock art sites were not the only salient, well situated places that were sites of rituals. Um, you have we also have effigy rocks and boulders. Uh, which, will also, which were also recognized as places where other than human persons could be addressed and where interpretations between um, interactions between the peoples took place. Um, so these salient rocks, rocks they acted as landmarks um, and they were located near aggregation places. Um, and especially if they were located near those aggregation places, they were ideal places for people to interact. Of course, people are nearby, they're going to get together at these sites. So um, the archaeologist George Laidlaw, one of the first archaeologists in Ontario, he wrote in 1917 about one such important rock art on Sturgeon Lake in Ontario. Um, Sturgeon Lake is, um, is in, in the south of Ontario. Um, um, for those of you who know anything about the um, Peterborough petroglyphs, well, it's kind of in the general area of Peterborough petroglyphs, but um, <clears throat> so um, Sturgeon Lake um, is located uh, on an old canoe route from Georgian Bay to Lake Ontario, so it's an important canoe route. So this rock, this rock, it acted as an aggregation point where intertribal meetings took place, and what um, Laidlaw said in his, in his um, report was, and I quote, just across Sturgeon Lake, there is an unusually large and round shaped granite boulder. Not many years ago, it was high up on the lake, lake bank beyond high water. It was very, it was a very conspicuous object. Of late years, the waves have undermined the bank and the boulder has fallen into the water. It is now known as Treaty Rock. And the story goes that it was there that rival tribes from East and West used to meet, shake hands, make treaties, exchange wampum belts, etc. End of quote. So we have another conspicuous place um, where people used to meet. And so these rare accounts, um, they point uh, that uh, they, they indicate that rock art sites placed at strategic locations, such as entry points in Tundaki Menan, or on major water routes could be the scenes of, of rituals where alliances and relationships were formed and renewed. So alliances between different nations. So again, we're going beyond this, um, this, this sacred, um, strictly sacred interpretation. Um, what you have on the screen here is another important rock, um, the Toral Rock from Algonquin Park. And if you ever um, come up to um, Ontario, I strongly suggest you go camping to Algonquin Park. It's just beautiful. It's the oldest um, provincial park in Ontario. So um, this is a photo from uh, from 1922 um, of, of this effigy rock um, call, called the Turtle Rock. Um, so you can clearly see that it's that it's, you know, it's standing out in the landscape. Um, this rock, I don't know exactly what rituals were being held at this rock, but uh, we have a bunch of accounts dating uh, starting in the 19th century, basically saying that there were all sorts of offerings being made at this rock. And to this day, this is a, a sacred site. Um, so um, rock art um, catered to various audiences uh, and had many functions. Um, and I want to discuss three sites with you in particular, um, the, which I have identified as public. So there's the Diamond Lake site, the Mystery Rock Pictograph sites, site on Ababika Lake, and the Matachewan Lake site. And these sites are perfect candidates for public sites because they are salient. They are associated with important water routes and their images tend also to be varied and interesting. 
So uh, what you have here on the screen is the Diamond Lake site. And this site is located on a small lake surrounded by major lakes, Lake Tamagami, Lake Ababika, Lady Evelyn Lake. And all of these lakes were important aggregation zones. So um, the lake itself is part of an important um, interior travel route. Actually, there's a bunch of them, but um, two of them especially that connected these lakes together. So you could go from Lake Tamagami through Diamond Lake to Lady Evelyn, Evelyn Lake, or from Tamagami Lake, go around uh, through Ababika Lake and then to Diamond Lake. So, um, you know, it's a labyrinth in there. So you can take many, many different ways of getting to places. But point is, Diamond Lake was kind of in between all those lakes. Um, <clears throat> And one of these routes um, um, that I mentioned, um, uh, the one from, let's say, from Tamagami through Diamond Lake through Lady Evelyn Lake, that leads to Montreal River. And Montreal River is connected with the Ottawa River. And Ottawa River is connected with the St. Lawrence River. So you, you have this amazing route that you can just take and you know get to this major, major highway, which is the St. Lawrence River. And the Diamond Lakes uh, indigenous toponym uh, refers to five portages that lead into five different directions. So there's this idea of travel is, is, is uh, contained within the name, the original name of the lake. Um, and indeed it is a, like a central station in a way, this lake um, that leads, um, that heads to major water bodies, uh, whether it be Lake Temagami or Babika, or Lady Evelyn. And for anyone here uh, today on this talk who is from Montreal, Diamond Lake for me, it's like the Berucam metro station, you know, the one that basically uh, connects everything in Montreal. Um, uh, so the spectacular site on Diamond Lake um, has many bright images and you can actually see them on this photo. I mean, they're so bright, you can see them because in a lot, on a lot of those sites, it's, they're very hard to see and thank God for this stretch uh, because honestly, you have to know sometimes that the site is there because you can't see it. So here we have bright images um, and this site has the most varied pictorial content in the entire Temagami area. Uh, among all of the sites um, that are located within the ter territory of Ndaki Menan uh, and which are not on the borders, which I'm going to get to later, well, Diamond Lake has the most of representational images, the, this figurative images. So um, uh, images of uh, canoes, images of, 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 you know, this horned snake. I don't know if you can see it, but the horned snake is clearly visible here. There's a, there's a bird over here, bird tracks. There's this beautiful canoe right here. And there's some of those abstractions, but uh, um, it, it has the greatest variety of images and, and most of those figure, figurative images as well. And Diamond Lake is associated with the Meimei Guishi book, who are said to dwell within this cliff. And there is um, this large vertical fault, fault that I'm pointing to right now with my, with my, with my mouse, and it's located between panels seven and eight, and it literally looks like a door. So, you know, an entry point uh, into, the, into, the, into the actual uh, cliff. So you, you, don't, you don't only get the cracks as, you know, entry points. You can actually get those um, cliff formations that literally have this um, shape that invites you to uh, go inside. Another interesting thing about this site is that it is located on the traditional family lands of a 19th century medicine man known as Wandaban. Wendaban. So we have actually uh, the name of the medicine man and we know roughly where his lands were located and Diamond Lake was on his lands. So this indicates that at some point he created some of the rock art and used the place for spiritual uh, practices. So a specialized knowledge is associated with medicine men. Um, and such knowledge uh, would be contained in, in those ubiquitous lines, but uh, it would not be contained in those lines, actually, sorry. It wouldn't be contained in those ubiquitous lines, but rather in those rare, unique, abstract, representational images. And those are present on Lake, on Diamond Lake. 
Um, there are some rare abstract ge geometric motifs. Um, there's that horned serpent, um, the, on the only one of its kind in the entire area. Um, we have those amazing canoes as well. Uh, we have uh, animals, we have that bird, we have that bear that I showed you uh, on the other slide, which a possible tail coming up from his rump. Um, and we have anthropomorphs, including one which you cannot see because this one is actually very, very faint and really just comes out in this stretch. And it's a, a pro it's a profile view of an anthropomorph. Um, and he's ethophallic. So those, those are very, very, very rare in the Canadian Shield. So there's some very rare images at this site, not only in the area, but even in the Canadian Shield. Um, but again, we have a lot of abstractions. We have the so-called abstractions. We have a lot of those... Uh, common abstractions, you know, tally marks, those parallel lines, and then we have also some um, more uh, unique ones, um, like, for example, that um, circle within a circle that I'm pointing to right now. Um, so the presence of these images combined with the potent physical features, such as the cracks, which you see all over the place on this cliff, and the fact that the cliff is white, and white is a spiritually potent color among Algonquian-speaking peoples. Um, and the fact that there is ample space at the top for, for, to gather, you know, to have people um, sit at the top and gather together. Um, um, and the fact as well that the site is located near um, now submerged falls. There used to be a waterfall, but like uh, in, in, most, uh, in many places in the Canadian Shield, um, they ended up building dams. Some of them were hydroelectric, some of them were uh, for um, uh, the wood industry, um, the forestry industry. So basically they changed the water levels and there used to be falls besides this, beside this rock art site, but now um, they are submerged. And falls naturally are, are, are very potent spiritual places. So um, combining all of this, um, this place is basically a, an amazing, a great place uh, for building and sustaining relationships with other than human persons. Um, it made a great landmark on, on a major interior route. And it was also a place where um, other than human persons could be asked uh, for safe travels. Um, it is also a place that is near major aggregation areas. You know, I, I, I just told you there was Lake Tamagami, Ababika, Lady Evelyn. I mean, those were places where people used to live. So it's kind of in the middle of all that. So it's a great meeting spot. It's a great meeting spot for, for communal rituals. And Diamond Lake right now is, I think, is the, the most known site in, in all of Tamagami area. And in, in my opinion, I think everybody knows about this site because it's just also so visible. Because I mean, there's people who, who, who will be canoeing in Tamagami and they have no idea there is rock art. But this site, it, there's, there's a strong chance it's gonna like jump out at them. So now I wanna turn to the other side, the mystery rock pictograph site on Lake Ababika, which you see the name right here at the bottom. So it's located on a major lake in an area that has been home to people for millennia. And this site is located on a series of tall cliffs. Um, and um, there aren't that many images. Um, and the images, in fact, are barely visible. <laughs> you once again have to know that the images are there. Uh, but the site is important because it's located near uh, an effigy formation, the grandmother and grandfather rocks. And this effigy formation, it stands out. Um, <clears throat> So um, effigies, um, they are found uh, at, at a few sites in the Tamagami area. Um, so um, you have those uh, standing effigies, and then you have also sites um, where uh, the rock is projecting from the cliff, and it creates this um, illusion of a face uh, coming out of a cliff. So you have different expressions of effigies. But, uh, um, but this is the most famous um, uh, effigy rocks in all of the area. And... Um, um, <clears throat> Conway, Thor Conway, who used to work in this area in, in the 1980s, um, he was informed that um, there is an Ababika Narrows archaeological site, uh, which was occupied since the archaic period, and it was used seasonally in early fall uh, by the residents of Ababika Lake, as well as other Temagami Bend uh, families. And they would come to Ababika Lake um, to profit from this abundant fish supply in the lake. 
And he was told that it is during this time that ceremonies were being uh, were carried out at the mystery rock pictograph. Um, so um, <clears throat> that makes one connection with 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 um, communal rituals. Uh, but the site is actually um, located with near other old archaeological habitation sites. Um, and what is also fun is that um, at this site, there's a small ledge that actually could accommodate a small group of people. So um, overall, it's, it's just a great place for communal rituals. And those rituals are actually being carried out uh, to this day. Um, there is an elder who lives um, right across the side, right across the side on the other side of the lake, there's an elder who lives there. And um, he um, has those annual ceremonies um, and, and some of them take place actually at, at those grandmother and grandfather rocks. So um, what, another thing that is fun with this site is that the mystery rock pictograph is a great example that images are not important in defining a public site. Um, the images are not particularly um, you know, visible, um, but the site is located on a salient cliff, on an important interior route, near habitation sites and near those uh, grandmother and grandfather rocks. So um, this actually uh, has more bearing on its importance than, um, you know, um, than this obsession of what is actually um, on the rocks that um, you know, we, we, we tend to have sometimes um, when we do rock art. <laughs> Um, so the final site is the Matachewan Lake site, and I want to thank Bill, who's with us today, for um, providing me with the photo of the site. So uh, the Matachewan Lake site is a large site um, in the north of Ndaki Menan. And it is located roughly on its boundary. Um, now, again, even the territorial boundaries, they were not set in stone, so they could move. So it's, it is roughly at this boundary. Um, and it is also in an area where rock art sites are sparse. You know, there's that, there aren't that many rock art sites. Actually, um, most of the rock art sites are in the middle, you know, on the major lakes. And when we get out of those major lakes, there's very, very few sites um, on, on, on the periphery of the, of, of the, of the territory. So um, the site, it contains uh, many abstract images. Um, it is located on a salient cliff. I mean, just look at this cliff. That's something that's going to catch your attention. And it actually has the highest count of, of, of motifs of, of images in the entire area. Um, so um, some of the motifs are, um, I, again, it's, it's mostly abstractions, the so-called abstractions. Um, so uh, some of these geometric motifs um, are very common, like, you know, again, parallel lines, simple lines, um, but some of them are unique unique to the site, um, which could again point to a type of specialized knowledge that is being um, um, conveyed at this place. And across from the site, um, there is a round hill and a space for a small campsite. So again, that would be a, a, a place where you could actually hold a ritual and be uh, close to this uh, site. But it is the location of this site on a travel route that is actually even more interesting because it is located on what I call a highway. So in order to reach James Bay, James Bay all the way in the north, uh, James Bay, the James Bay watershed, and obviously all the fur trade posts that uh, were located uh, in that watershed, one option was to travel along that Montreal River that I mentioned, go towards Matachewan Lake and then Portage, across the height of the land. So height of the land basically means it's like this barrier that um, divides water. So on one side, all of the water will be going uh, towards the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence. And on the other side, all of the water is going towards James Bay. So it's very important you know, to uh, follow um, those watersheds um, when you're canoeing. So, um, so you could portage across, uh, you, you could get to Matachewan Lake, portage across the height of the land, and you would be in the James Bay uh, watershed. Um, and Lake Matachewan, so, so this lake is on one of the possible routes towards James Bay. I mean, there are others, of course, it's a labyrinth, but it's on one of these routes. Um, so if you're going north, that's a place to, you know, possibly venture to and um, take if you're going up north. And it is also an ideal liminal place um, to perform travel-related re rituals, um, especially if you're going on this long uh, 
voyage um, all the way to James Bay. And it's liminal, like, uh, you know, not only because there's other than human persons, but it's like literally liminal because you're changing watersheds. Um, so in general, sites located on major travel routes uh, that led in and out of Ndaki Menan, such as this site, but there are other sites, uh, for example, the Ferris Lake site, um, um, the Matagamasi, Matagamasi Lake site. Um, all of these sites are actually uh, physically salient and they have more images than the sites which are located on the interior routes. So there's something clearly going on here. Um, but um, there's another function that could be added to this site. So this site is on this boundary, on the territorial boundary. So it's at the entry or exit point into the territory. Um, so it would have been suitable for rituals uh, where members of various nations um, uh, would negotiate social boundaries, where they would meet, where they would you know, renew alliances, create new alliances. Um, and um, there is an account of such a ceremony in the Temagami area on a site that now is submerged because of the rising water level because they constructed a dam. So the site is inundated now. And the site is underwater in the area where uh, roughly where Montreal River again meets with Lady Evelyn Lake. So it's an, it's an important entry point into Ndaki Menan. So in the 1980s, there was an elder from the Temagami band um, who stated that the site in the past was used um, for various ceremonies. And he said that, and I cite, that is when they gather after the war was over, I guess. And they had all had a feast, all different tribes. People come there, they gather there at one time. So um, end of quote. So this place would have been um, the scene of those um, intertribal um, ceremonies um, that sought to restore harmony, strengthen alliances, and give thanks for successful endeavors um, after a time of conflict. Um, so this site is naturally, um, we don't know uh, exactly even where it is because it's submerged, but Matachewan could have been another site like that who um, had a similar function and uh, where, where relationships were um, actually um, not only built with the spiritual world like we tend to um, mostly um, think, but also between humans. Um, so um, I showed you three sites, um, three different sites um, that I have identified as public sites. Um, and these sites had many functions. Uh, and they are located on salient cliffs. Um, they tend to have many and varied images and they were visited by many people, um, either because um, they were near aggregation areas or because they were located on those important highways. So um, it's clear that it's um, the landscape characteristics uh, and the location within the larger, larger landscape context that actually helped for these places to emerge and become those nodes of encounter and interaction. So paths are important. We tend to um, concentrate on the place, but uh, in a way I, I am all for paths and I'm trying to, you know, like uh, um, cheer for them in a way. And as Tim Ingold said, uh, and I cite, and I quote, um, to reach a place, uh, you need cross no boundary, uh, but you must follow some kind of path. Thus, there can be no places without paths along which people arrive and depart, and no paths without places that constitute their destinations and points of departure. So um, in rock art studies, um, the images are um, more important. Obviously, we're doing rock art. So the art component um, seems to be you know, the part we most often look at. But um, the, rock the rock component of rock art um, is just as important. And I would even say it's actually even more important for uh, for um, for the place itself, for what rock art actually meant and the functions it had. Because um, rock art is um, total and immersed landscape art in a way. It's teeming with activity, um, sociability, a living presence. Um, so um, not only I think we should go uh, beyond, you know, just strictly um, sacred uh, interpretations, but I think we should really um, go beyond the images and um, really look at how landscape is actually the reason why 
those landscape characteristics are the reason why we end up having rock art sites where they are. So um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for staying with me and, and for listening to my talk. And um, yeah, and I hope it was interesting. So thank you. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Dagmara. Um, let's see. I don't know. I make myself visible again. Turn myself from a rock art image back into myself. Um, so we um, do have uh, time for some questions now. A couple have come in uh, during the talk. And right now, if you want, people can use chat in order to ask any other questions that you have. Um, so there was a question about uh, the archaeology. You mentioned yep. uh, aggregation sites. So what kind of uh, sort of physical archaeology at these gathering sites um, you know, do, do you find how big is an aggregation site? You know, how, how do we get a sense for, you know, what an aggregation site actually means in terms of, you know, number of people or tribes involved? Yeah, this is a great question. And I must just tell you, first and for, uh, first of all, archaeology in the north um, is not that very present. There's not that much archaeology being done. In, in the Canadian Shield, unfortunately. Um, I mean, it's far, it's remote. Um, in the Tamagami area, for example, there was quite a lot of it done in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, as far as I know, nothing is being done right now. So um, what I did um, is I basically looked up the archeological reports because I didn't do any digging and you can't really dig at those sites unless you do underwater archeology, span which would be great. Um, and there's one place where it has been done in Northwestern Ontario and actually they found stuff under the site, um, like offerings, uh, but nothing like that has been done in the Tamagami area. So what I did is I looked at the archeological reports and I identified uh, places which were um, campsites. And the beauty of it is that um, those campsites, those ancient campsites, um, you know, once they've been occupied, you, you get stuff from the archaic period, period from the uh, woodland period, all the way to the historical period. So you know that they've been occupied for ages, ages and ages. Um, and some of them are large. Some of them are large. And I'll tell you why I know this uh, in a sec. But um, basically, they, they tend to be occupied for, occupied for a long period of time. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> That's how, you know, that's how I inferred that, you know, they were basically being revisited and revisited. And those were the major sites that, you know, people would go back to. Now, how do I know that they would be aggregation sites, you know, camping sites? I camped on those sites. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of being up north because a lot of the sites right now, which are considered crown land, you don't even know it, but you might be actually camping on an archaeological site. And I've done it and I've seen it. And obviously those, those sites are basically perfect. You know, you have like this perfect beach or like this perfect landing for your canoe. And, you know, and it's up there. So you won't be inundated on or it's on a channel and there's like wind going through. So you won't be eaten by those mosquitoes. So, you know, there's all those great things about the sites that have been, you know, identified like centuries ago. And I just don't see why people would change it, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, why change something if it's not broken, you know, like whatever that expression goes. But um, yeah, so um, so those would be the sites that people would uh, aggregate at. Um, and obviously there's islands. Islands would be uh, preferred places as well for, you know, for aggregation sites. And some of the sites you can clearly see they would have been large. Some of them are small. And the thing is that if, if those archaeologists were digging, they would be digging mostly on the larger sites um, than the smaller sites. But honestly, um, um, one thing that I found very problematic uh, is that um, there's just like not much, not enough archaeology being done in this area. Um, Lake Tamagami was you know, um, in a way excavated, let's say they excavated, they searched a bunch of sites, Obabika as well, because it's nearby, but Anima Nipissing, it kind of, you know, I, I, I don't, I, yeah, I think there's like one or two reports from the seventies. And then when you get, go further up north, nothing, practically nothing, or it has been done, but you have no access to the archeological reports for reason X, Y, Z. So, um, so that actually um, is very problematic that um, you cannot make those connections easily. And because it's all on water, you know, um, it's not that easy to excavate. And um, as I said, um, Canadian Shield is kind of, even though it's huge, 
uh, people tend to, you know, go into the south of Ontario, where you have the Haudenosaunee or Iroquoian sites, you know, with villages and where you have the Jesuit relations and you can read them and you can be like, aha, I can identify what's going on over here. But in the north, we don't have the same situation. So put it this way, Canadian Shield is not as sexy as the south of Ontario for archaeologists, unfortunately. So um, there's less um, archaeology being done there. But um, that's how, um, yeah, that's how I, um, I basically took those reports. And, and I actually saw a lot of the sites myself. I actually camped on some of the sites. And um, you said that they found yeah. some uh, offerings at some sites. What would an offering consist of? OK, so uh, basically, the, the, the first and foremost for an offering, that would be tobacco. But um, in the historic period, um, what people have been offering, and, it, and, and I saw it myself in Northwestern Ontario, it would be clothing. So neatly folded clothing would be offered at the sites. And there's a reason for it, um, because clothing, um, uh, if you go back to those 19th century um, writings um, and, and you know, early ethnographies, clothing was a, a, a preferred type of gift for other than human persons. And the Mei Mei Guishi book, they love cloth. They like offerings of cloth. So, um, so that, that, that would be one of the offerings. Another offering that has been found um, was um, the, uh, money, like coins or um, even broken china. And now you might be thinking, okay, what's the connection? Well, the connection, um, I think, and I'm not the only one who thinks that actually, is, is the material itself. Uh, what counts is um, the fact that um, it's shiny, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be translucent, it can be brilliant. And those type of substances um, were always associated with other than human persons. Um, now again, um, um, I think um, there was one researcher who said that, you know, offering, for example, a uh, 25 cents, the, the Canadian quarter. For those of you who don't know our money, we have animals on our money. So the quarter has a moose on it. Oh, yeah, it's a moose or a caribou. I don't know. I haven't seen money in a long time because everything is like credit card now. <laughs> I'm not touching no money. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so uh, you might be saying, okay, so um, it's an offering that actually has an image of this important animal on it. Um, so those are, 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 are the offerings um, that I have seen. But uh, most of the time, it's some sort of tobacco. Um, that is being offered. And I remember my first offering that I, I made at a rock art site when I was doing my master's, I went to Lake Superior, Agawa Bay, which honestly, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's like, it's amazing. And I actually bought a cigar. So I actually offered a cigar <laughs> at uh, Agawa Bay. So uh, yeah, so those are the offerings. But the offerings that were actually found, I, I guess you're referring to the site that I mentioned um, where they were diving. Those offerings, um, it was in Northwestern Ontario. And um, it's one of those sites where you had a lot of cloth offering. And what the divers found was pieces of pottery. And um, stylistically dating the pottery, um, uh, I think the pottery was like close to possibly a thousand years old. Um, so um, it's nothing special like in terms of, wow, it's amazing pottery. What I think is interesting is, is the longevity of this place. It's the fact that it's been, you know, visited for centuries. I think that's where the potential is, is actually trying to find stuff that is super old at these sites and basically say, well, yeah, those sites have been there for so long. And, and you know, you can even see it with the offerings. So, um, yeah, but again, um, underwater archaeology, very few places that do it in the Canadian Shield, mostly associated with uh, the fur trade. That's where um, underwater archaeology will be um, heading. It's, it's, it's mostly um, exploited. Yeah, you, you estimated, I said, uh, I remember 2000 years, um, mm -hmm. you know, is that a, just a guess or is there some evidence that that's the earliest uh, that you have, uh, you know, that uh, in terms of uh, solid evidence? Okay, so um, this actually comes from um, two, um, two things. Um, first of all, um, Oh, uh, Grace Rynovich, I don't know if you guys have ever read anything by Grace Rynovich, but she um, she did a lot in the Canadian Shield in the 80s, and she published one of the few books on Canadian uh, Shield rock art in 1994. And she was basically saying um, that they would be like, um, you know, close to 2000 years based on the fact that she was comparing the distribution of rock art sites compared to actually um, other sites from the Middle Woodland period. But then again, as I said, those sites, they could have been used before, they could have been used after. So it's it's not a sol solid evidence, uh, but that's one way. Uh, and, you know, red ochre has been used at least uh, since that time period. Actually, it's even older they use, but um, 
So that's one estimate. It's 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 not you know it's it's not a solid evidence. There is one site that has been dated in all of Canadian Shield so far in Quebec. Um, it was dated to uh, be roughly around 2,000 years old. However, um, having spoken to people who actually do um, rock art dating, they said um, there's issues with this dating, um, and uh, they wouldn't swear by it. So, <laughs> so. Um, it was done in the 90s um so um i don't know like from from what i can see um like the sites that you know that are being described in the and in, in the ethnohistorical records we have sites where you know they're gonna say okay this guy's grandfather did it so we know there was a lot of stuff being done in the hist in the post-contact period a lot of it was done in the post-contact period how ancient it is honestly um unless we get dates i don't know um there is an actually um a group of scientists in Quebec who um, are going to be trying to date some of the sites. I don't know which ones. It was just kind of announced in the news, um, but they were trying for it. Um, so I don't know, but yeah, um, this we have uh, most of the dating is basically based on style and based on you know uh, it was we know that it's been described in an ethnohistorical relation or something like that. Um, so yeah, the dating is a major problem um, in the Canadian Shield. There's uh, not enough money for it, and um, yeah, I mean, not enough of it has been done. So actually, none of it has been done except for that one token site. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's that's an issue. Um, but um, I don't know if um, I saw I saw Brandy McDonald on the list here. Um, I don't know if she's yeah she's still here. Brandy with us. Brandy did get, did an amazing thing um, for her PhD thesis. Um, where she actually looked at the um, signature, um, the chemical signature of the of the ochre being used at the sites, and what she found is that uh, some sites were painted with different types of ochre, you know, not coming from the same source. So that also in, in indicates that you know people were traveling um, in the landscape and they were exchanging stuff, and some sources of ochre were more important than others. So um, that's a fun thing that's also just recently uh, began to be explored in the Canadian Shield. Um, I know that they've done more of it in in, in BC. So I mean, there's there's just basically a lot of stuff to do still. It's, yeah, it's okay. It's, so there was a question you know. actually about the yeah. uh, ochre and the distribution of the ochre. So maybe you could uh, give the Brandy's full name. So that's that. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, uh, Brandy L. McDonald. Sorry, Brandy, if I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you could look for her her PhD thesis. Hopefully, that's yeah. she makes yeah, that it's, public. It's, yeah. And, you yeah, it's, it's great because uh, because it's one of those like um, more scientific studies because um, Canadian Shield. Um, yeah, there has been scientific studies done in the Canadian Shield, uh, but um, um, lately it's been mostly um, landscape interpretation what I do. Um, but um, yeah, so um, yeah, it's great. It's it's great. You should you should totally check it out. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the, the landscape, um, so we had a, a question of whether there's uh, any evidence, you talked about that door thing that looked like a doorway. Is there any sort of uh, ethno, uh, ethnographic evidence that says that the Indians did think of, uh, you know, these being doorways into another world? Um, there is actually um, um, ethnographic evidence where cracks uh, were considered to be um, portals um, to the rock. There is, um, there is ethnographic evidence like that. Um, but again, if you if you if you look at uh, most of the rock art, you know you find it. A lot, uh, uh, I mean, you find it everywhere in the world. This idea of you know entering the rock um, through a crack. And and here I want to totally um, um, underline the fact that it is in the Canadian Shield that we actually had that those ideas about entering the rock through cracks. Um, they, they were actually um, developed in the Canadian Shield in the seventies already. So before we actually see it coming out in the African literature about the sun rock art. Um, so um, there is there is, is stories of, you know, um, there is stories of, you know, medicine men entering rocks through cracks. There is. And um, obviously for this site, um, you know, I don't know if it's an actual, if they thought it was an actual doorway. And again, if everybody in the community would have thought it was an actual doorway, because again, we cannot speak for, um, everybody of course and um it's not just maybe one person would have thought it was a doorway maybe everybody else didn't see the connection i don't know but um it kind of looks like it and 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 you see those like special places um uh where you know the 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 color of the rock the 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 
shape of the rock, it, it, it really gets you. Like, I'm going to tell you a story. I was, um, I was in Misinaibi area, which is even further up north, and it's amazing. So if you want to ever go in, uh, camping, go there as well. <laughs> and um, I knew there was a rock art site uh, at the Ferry Point site, a very famous site on this on this Misinaibi lake over there. And I knew it was someplace there, and I had no idea where. Um, I knew we were getting close to it. I haven't seen it yet. And at one point, we hit rock that was black. Now, you don't get black rock. You know, it's 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 mostly, you know, grayish, brownish, whatever. But this part was black. And sure enough, we turned the corner and there's the site. So um, there is those, you know, like um, physical um, properties that, you know, um, I think that as, as humans, we can all recognize their importance. And, you know, we can all appreciate that something is conspicuous in the landscape. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the Ojibwe, right, had a migration uh, about what three, four hundred years ago. Are are there migration stories that might relate to these sites? Um, it's mostly in um, the birch bark scrolls. So um, the Ojibwe birch bark scrolls, the Anishinaabe birch bark scrolls, um, they are the ones who um, speak mostly of uh, uh, those. Um, um, migration stories where the Anishinaabe basically migrated from the east, um, from the eastern seaboard and um, they ended up, you know, um, in the west around the Great Lakes, stopping at different locations and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a migration story. Some of them are going to stop in this spot and, and, for example, in another spot they were going to be um, receiving a type of teaching. Um, there, what happened with those migration stories that I, I personally, I can't think of any site which would be like associated with it specifically. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe it's just not coming to my head right now, but there are those birch bark scrolls. And um, there was a, a thesis uh, written by Rex Weeks where he actually um, identified on a bunch of rock art sites the same images that you find in those birch bark scrolls um, at rock art sites. It was linked with the Mede women and, and those migration stories. But um, I can't think of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of any actual site where I would know 100% that it's linked to uh, to the migration stories. That's mostly the birch bark scrolls, the migration birch bark scrolls. Right. But, and the Mede um, would, would have been a medicine society, right? Yeah, the Mede women is, um, yeah, sorry. I'm just like talking like if you all knew what Mede women was. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a medicine society. It's a, it's it's an important medicine society for both men and women, um, which was actually ranked. So you could be like uh, first order, second, third, and you know the higher up you went, the more specialized the knowledge was, and you had to pay to get in there. Uh, but they were known for healing um, uh, rights, and you know they were kind of like the custodians of oral stories of of the histories of of the people. So uh, a very important um, medicine society. Um, documented at the contact period, um, but clearly they existed before the contact period, even though um, some ethno historians claim that they are only a post contact phenomenon because they have crosses as if crosses were only linked to Christianity. Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, cross is such a universal symbol that uh, no, it, that, that's no, no. no. <laughs> We had another question was whether um, this might, the aggregations might have happened at a particular time of year. Yeah, um, there absolutely would have, like um, um, summer, fall. So in the summer, people would get together in the fall, uh, at the beginning of the fall, you know, they would, um, you know, fish for that fish, for example, prepare it. And in the winter time, they would scatter to their hunting grounds. So um, those um, aggregations, they would be mostly during the warmer summer su months. And then in the winter time, they would just go off into their hunting territories and uh, stay off by themselves. And then once again, meet when it got warmer. So um, that's how it worked. Because you can't really survive the winter when you're all a bunch of people up north. Um, it's it's hard, you know, hunting and, and, and getting food. Um, you have to spread out. Yeah. So, yeah. I know when I was uh, researching some pictograph sites in Maine, that one, there seemed to be some evidence that there, they could have been used for military intelligence. In other words, leaving a message that you know so many canoes passed and this. Yeah. You know, yeah. This kind of, that, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Of that. 
Absolutely. Um, yes, uh, this is something that came up because um, actually what they used to do is actually in the Haudenosaunee Iroquois were known for uh, leaving messages in the park. Uh, Algonquin speaking peoples would leave uh, messages um, not on trees, but they would take the bark and they would just leave it someplace. Um, basically saying, okay, I passed through here um, and I'm going in this direction. I know that when uh, Samuel de Champlain was, um, uh, you know, exploring um, the lakes and rivers, um, he would have indigenous scouts and they would also look for those types of messages that could be left for them. Um, so, um, yes, and there are stories basically saying uh, that rock art could be like, yeah, we were here um, or people were here. Uh, we want that battle. So um, there are stories like that. Um, and there is this idea of leaving messages um, as you travel. So which could be all sorts of messages, but also like military reconnaissance messages. So that's that's a possibility that that is a possibility, I guess. Yeah, it but, might explain yeah. some of the abstractions. I mean, tally marks, certainly, but even the abstract symbols might be something that, you know, they could interpret, but no one else would unless they know, you know, what what they were intending. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the interpret. I mean, I mean, you know what? Interpretation is is, is very can be very frustrating, especially when you have abstractions, because um, you have those indeterminate figures, and um, and then you have one. I swear to God, there's one one image like that in this area where one researcher says it is a horned snake uh, coming out of the water, and then another guy comes in and he says, no, it's a hand with three fingers. You know, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it can be very, very hard to even, you know, like, what are you actually seeing? So, um, you know, our interpretation is going to be totally based on um, our preconceptions, on how we see stuff, on what we think. Um, and going back again um, uh, to um, this problem, uh, Selwyn Dudney, that father of Canadian rock art research, um, there's this great site called um, the Bonico in Ontario. Another site, if you want to go camping, it's in a provincial park. Um, and there's this figure which looks like a human figure with those ears. And he basically said, Selwyn Dudney, well, it looks like Nana Bush. Nana Bush is the cultural hero of, of, of the Ojibwe people. Uh, and of the Anishinaabe and one of and his alter ego is a rabbit so it kind of looked like those you know um, rabbit hair um, ears and then he said and then everybody jumped on it and he's like oh yeah so this side has to be totally you know um, Ojibwe because you know this is this is what it's represented on the site and he regretted it he's like I, I you know I shouldn't have said that because people are just jumping to conclusions right away so um, yeah, it's, it's it's you have to be careful what you're saying about the stuff you're seeing, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of interpretations, um, Steve Waller shared um, something from uh, it looked like a Fert Fertman in 2000. He says handprints were left by the mischievous, mysterious Mimigwe uh showing where they touched the rock as they closed the door before disappearing into their dwellings in the cliffs. They supposedly seal their magic entrances to the rock with handprints. And then in Inu had heard a long time ago a noise of a door that was open and closed again in the rock that was said to have a portal. The sound of a door that opens and closes on the side of a cliff. And that came from uh, Parkere in 2000. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Steve. Hi, Steve. <laughs> So um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, exactly. So you have those um, you have those ideas of you know uh, people entering uh, the rocks and and you know the rocks closing behind them, you know, like a, a veil of some sorts um, and containing them within. And what's great is that once you enter the rock, you basically lose any sense of time and and being in a rock for you know for a day, and then when you get out of it, you realize that you know so many years have passed on Earth. You know, so it's, it's, it's this great, you know, like uh, um, time travel <laughs> um, um, uh, situation in a way once you enter the rock. So there's stories of, you know, people entering rocks, coming out of there and realizing that, you know, uh, their spouse has died, their kids have grown up, everybody thought they were dead, but here they are. And they were just there for like an hour. <laughs> so in the Indian stories? Yeah. Okay, because it sounds like Rip Van Winkle. Maybe that's where that came from. Is an, an Indian story. I um when well I uh, where did I read it? I, I read it from ethnographies. 
I, I read it in ethnographies. So, um, well, that's the great thing about the Canadian Shield. I mean, um, the ethnography started late in a way, but um, uh, we have some uh, amazing ethnography, you know, that we can go to, uh, for example, Hallowell in Manitoba, like he wrote some excellent stuff on rock art. Um, yeah, there is stuff and, and, and it, you know, and they do mention that idea of, you know, entering the rocks and coming out of there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not only with rock art, you know, there's there might be other instances of actually going into the rock without there being any rock art. So, yeah. Well, and, great. And, 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 oh, great. And, yeah, and I just to mention, because I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to shut up now, I guess. <laughs> but uh, um, some of the rock art sites, you know, um, the shape of them actually looks like a, a house, like um, Beaver Lodge. There's some like rounded outcrops that look like beaver lodges. So, um, you know, they're just um, perfect for, you know, in, uh, thinking that, you know, somebody lives in there. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, great. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic subject. We don't get to hear uh, as much as we'd like about the Canadian Shield. So we really appreciate uh, your presentation. Thank you. Um, and thanks again for all the attendees for your interest. Again, if you'd like to uh, learn more about what Aurora does, please check out our website and Facebook pages. And remind you that our final talk of this year will be on December 12th, when we will travel to Missouri with Carol Diaz Granados for a deep dive into Mississippian iconography. So until then, good evening and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>